Academy and for our family day for our son. And anyway, we're glad to be back to worship with Cascade today. Well, before we uh, dig into God's Word, I'd invite you to pray where you're at, ask the Lord to bless us, and I'm going to pray up here and ask for His blessing as well. Uh, we need to hear what He wants to share with us through the Holy Spirit, and I need to be able to speak what He wants shared through the same. So let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we are grateful for this opportunity to come before you and worship you. Thank you for Jesus. And Lord, uh, this morning we wish to hear your voice, receive the blessings from your word, the water of life from the true fountain of life. Lord, forgive us for our sins. Please cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let there not be anything that would hinder a blessing uh, just now from you. Cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Uh, clothe us with thy righteousness, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. So if you open your Bibles to Luke chapter 2, you'll find that very familiar passage where there is angels uh, in the field by night, and they were keeping watch over their sheep. And that's in Luke chapter 2, verse 8. And I am suggesting that there wasn't likely a lot of fences back then. Uh, we tend to keep livestock all fenced up now, and so we don't have to treat them very well anymore to keep them under control. So for a, have you ever noticed that? If you go to like a state fair or something and you ever watched how they're handling the pigs as they bring them in for showing them? Yeah, they've got these electronic prods. And they got these big old um, boards, you know, and they, and they start pushing and shoving and smacking behind the pigs to get them to go where they want them to go. And, and someone's around the corner with an electric prod to get them, and they squeal as they go. And finally, they get them where they, where they want them to be. But I think they have those big boards, because if you come up and jam a pig hard enough, I suppose they could turn around and bite your knee or something. But... Uh, Anyway, when you have fences, you don't have to treat animals very well to keep them under control, but if they're free roaming, why then you have to be looked at as a, something of a safe place so that they'll follow and you won't lose them all. They don't want to view you as the wolf. They want to view the wolf as the wolf, right? And so the shepherds out in the field by night taking care of their sheep are protecting them and the sheep are staying in a flock because they are helping to keep them together through the characteristic that the shepherd has to help keep them bound there in a safe place. And an angel of the Lord stood before them and the glory of the Lord shone around them and they were greatly afraid. And the angel said to them, do not be afraid. And this is, this is something that the sheep shouldn't be afraid of the shepherd, right? They, that's what, you know, they, they want to gather to the shepherd. The, the angels say to the sh uh, shepherds, Don't be afraid, for there is born to you this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign to you. You will find a babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly hosts praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace, goodwill towards men. Isn't this kind of the same characteristics that the shepherds have towards their sheep that the angels are now singing is the characteristic of God towards people? And so we find in the Bible over and over again a symbolic representation of God's relationship with his people like a shepherd with sheep. And we found in John that the good shepherd gives his life for his sheep and Jesus says he is a good shepherd. It is interesting that when the angels went away, that the shepherds made haste, and they went to see this thing of, of the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes there, lying in a manger. And when they had seen him, in verse 17, it says they made widely known the saying which was given to them. It occurs to me that they became kind of like the first missionaries right then. And I don't know how wide they went, but they went wide enough to be noted that they actually returned in verse 20. You know, they went, uh, th this was not something that they just kept to themselves. They, they went everywhere spreading this news as far as we can tell from this passage. 
I imagine that as good shepherds, as they went out spreading the good news about a God who had good will towards men, that they exhibited the same characteristics that they had with the sheep. I don't think they probably went around with their staves and yoked someone around the neck with a hook at the end of that thing and says, let me tell you, there's a, a babe born in Bethlehem. Now, you should get down and see him. Whack. <laughs> I don't think that's the way they went about that. I think they probably went about it the same way that they handled their sheep. And that's what we want to talk about today. Shepherds and sheep and soul winning. We're preparing for telling other people of the good news about Jesus. We want to do that every day that we have the opportunity, but we're officially and formally uh, organizing to do that in January. Uh, January 17th will, uh, I believe it is, when we start our Revelation of Hope series here. Now, this goes along with what Jesus asked us to do in Matthew 28, 19. He says, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, it's baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you, and behold, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. That's a familiar passage, Matthew 28, 19 and 20. It's interesting that... Um, even down in times of trouble, not just in good times, are we to spread the good news of Jesus. When things get rough and things are hard, it's still a good time to share about Jesus. Listen to what Daniel 12, 1 to 3 says. At that time, this is talking about a time that's still yet to come, but at that time shall Michael, the great prince who is charge of your people, he shall stand and there shall be a time of trouble as never has been since there was a nation until that time. But at that time, your people will be delivered, everyone whose name shall be found written in the book. And many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, and some to shame and everlasting contempt. And those who are wise, in Daniel 12, verse 3, says, they will shine like the brightness of the sky above, and those who turn many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. So this is soul winning going on in difficult times. Soul winning, I'd like to suggest to you here that soul winning starts with, with who rather than with what. Isn't that the way the shepherds and the sheep related? Didn't it start with who the shepherd was rather than what the shepherd wanted of the sheep? I mean, because the shepherd could want all kinds of things from the sheep, but if he wasn't someone that the sheep were willing to follow then nothing's going to happen. And so soul winning starts with the who rather than the what is what I'd like to suggest to you this morning. Too often in soul winning, we think that we are communicating what as the primary objective, some sort of knowledge that they need to know rather than someone they need to know. John 12.32 says, well, what are, we, what are we trying to win souls for? from and for anyway. The Bible says, you shall call his name Jesus for he will save his people from their sins. Have you ever gone around trying to talk to someone about their sins? How does it go? It takes a very special characteristic to win souls. And I think we're going to find that as we study along here. Jesus says, And I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me in John 12, 32. In John 7, verse 37 and 38 and 39, Jesus says, On the last day of the feast, the great day, Jesus stood up and cried out, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. Now this he said about the Spirit, whom those who believed in him were to receive, for as yet the Spirit had not been given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. So we find here that in soul winning, Jesus must be lifted up. He is to draw people to him. This isn't something where you compel people to him, right? It's a sad day through... 600 years of the dark ages were compelling was the operating principle of bringing one into the kingdom of God. 
He compelled someone even to the point of putting them on a rack and stretching them out. Compel someone to put them in the flames of the fire. Compel someone by hoisting them up with a weight tied to their feet and then dropping them suddenly so that every time they dropped, they stretched a little more and their joints would come out. All for the purposes of bringing people into the kingdom of God. It's not surprising that sheep run from that kind of stuff. So what is the modus operandi that Jesus uses? He doesn't use compelling methods to win souls to his kingdom. He is the good shepherd. It would not surprise us that he would use compassion instead of compelling, right? So Jesus must be lifted up to draw people. And then there's the invitation here that we read when he invited people to come to him and drink. The invitation to come to Jesus. So there's a drawing. There's an invitation. There's not a compelling. There's not a forcing. There's not a a whack with the stick, as it were. It's the drawing of compassion. Now, I've already let the cat out of the bag here because after the who comes the how. We're for to lift up Jesus, who is the who. How do we do that? I already let you know. Already, we, we could, I could sit down and we could go home, right? The words for today is what? Compassion. <laughs> but let's back that up. How should we lift up Jesus? A sermon, a song, an altar, an offering call, or maybe something a little deeper? How should we invite people? Well, let's do a little look at some scriptures in the Old Testament. I'd like to draw your attention to If you have a pencil, you might write them down. I hope I don't go through them too fast. Psalm 78, verse 38. I think you'll like these verses. Psalms 78, verse 38. But he, this is talking about God, being full of compassion, forgave their iniquity and destroyed them not Yea, many a time turned he his anger away and did not stir up all his wrath. What was God full of? Compassion. Psalms 86 verse 15. Just turn a few Psalms over. Psalms 86 verse 15. But thou, O Lord, art a God full of compassion and gracious, long-suffering and plenteous in mercy. I like that. We don't use that word too often, plenteous. But it gives you the idea that there's a lot of it, you know. Plenteous in mercy and truth. Go a little bit farther down in the Old Testament to Isaiah 49.15. God uses the example of a mother because it's like, well, wait, wait, wait. What does compassion mean, you know? Uh, So God has compassion. What does that mean? You know, just real quick, we have the word passion in there, which is suffering, right? Right? And right at the beginning, if you chop off the front, it says co. So if you co-passion with somebody, you're entering in to their sufferings, their um, journey with them in a great way. Compassion. Can a woman forget her sucking child that she should not have compassion on the son of her womb? And this is, you know, a... By and far, one of the greatest images we have of compassion is a mother and a child. This is amazing, right? They enter into the needs of their children in ways that, um, well, it's, I mean, it speaks for itself, just the, the visual imagery of it. However, that compassion can dry up, says, yea, they may forget, but God says, I will not forget you. Go a little bit further, Micah 7.19. I want you to see the relationship between compassion and this idea of Jesus saving people from their sin because he was to be named Jesus because he was going to be the savior from sin. Micah 7.19, it says, he will 
return again, he will have compassion on us, and he will subdue our iniquities, and thou will cast all their sins into the depths of the sea. How is a person's sin subdued here? It's with compassion, right? Something answers in them to the compassion that has been given to them, and they wish to be free from the sin that snares them. So when we say when we, you know, when we're talking about the idea of evangelizing and the whole idea is going, a sinner finding a savior, then at some point one addresses sin and salvation. So in order to talk to anybody about sin that has any kind of good, it has to be communicated through the venue of compassion. Now, I wish I could say that I had this down perfectly. I wish I could say that I have a great track record with this. I'm pointing you to Jesus. Jesus has a great track record of this. And he, he is the way, the truth, and the life of which we all are to follow, including me. Um, I know from experience, uh, unfortunately, that... Uh, you can't scare animals into submission. In my earlier life, I thought that scaring animals was a good way to train animals. No, I don't think that anymore. Compassion works so much better. So much better. Yeah, I've, I haven't ever lived on a farm, but I've had the opportunity to live around a lot of animals, from horses to cows to chickens to goats to pigeons. It's a good thing to be around animals, but compassion goes much further than compelling. I was um, traded a, a pickup truck for a horse, not intentionally, I was intending to trade it for money. But the fellow who bought the pickup truck, I, was, I think I was 18 um, or 19, and I bought this pickup truck. Uh, you know, dads sometimes, they're like wondering what their sons are up to, and I saw this uh, Ford 250 long bed double cab pickup truck, and they were selling it for 800 bucks. Of course, you know, a pickup truck like that for $800 pretty much isn't roadworthy. But uh, we got it home, and uh, it was fun to tinker around with that thing. It had so much power, it was unbelievable. Anyway, pretty soon realized I had nowhere near enough money to get that thing roadworthy. And so someone came along, and they're like, man, I could use a truck like that. And uh, yeah, what would you be willing to give? Well, I'll give 800 bucks. Well, that's what I paid for it, so it's yours. Unfortunately, he took the truck, but never gave me the money. So a couple months went by, and... I was back at school, and my dad ended up doing some negotiation with him, and my dad knows that I love horses a lot. And he's like, what about trading your horse for that truck? And uh, so I came back, and he's like, well, he's willing to give you his horse for that truck. I said, well, that sounds a good deal. I love horses a lot. And uh, so the day came, I went down to pick up the horse from their place. Well, this horse is the type of horse that doesn't like people. And uh, I, went, I went down to the corral uh, where this horse was at their place. And I've, I've been around a lot of horses and I've done a lot of working with horses in my past. And I couldn't get close to that horse. That horse would, would hurt you. And uh, so I ended up sitting in the corner of the corral with a bucket of food for an hour and 45 minutes. And eventually that horse came over and wanted to get at some of those oats and molasses in there. And of course I had the halter there, so he had to put his head through the halter in order to get his head in the bucket. But it was an hour and 45 minutes of not yelling at the horse, not chasing the horse, not beating the horse. Of course, I learned later that that's how they handled the horse, was they would, would uh, chase it around, you know, with whips and whatever, and try to get it cornered and finally get, you know... So that horse never was a good horse to be around when you're on the ground. Once you got on its back, everything was fine. But on the ground, it, was, it had this trauma that it had gone through. And so sitting and waiting patiently for it for an hour and 45 minutes um, just 
talking softly to it went a long ways to gaining that horse's confidence. It says in Micah 7.19 that his compassion, it says, is correlated. Well, it doesn't say that. I'm, I'm suggesting strongly that God's compassion is correlated strongly with subduing our iniquities. Would you agree with that? Would you agree with that? Matthew 9.36 is another verse. We're moving into the New Testament on compassion. Matthew 9.36 I hear some pages turning. It says, But when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion on them because they fainted and were scattered abroad as sheep having no shepherd. So once again, we see this compassion. Of course, this is leading up into the feeding of the uh, great multitude with the loaves and the fishes. Later on uh, in the Gospels, we find again that Jesus has compassion on some blind men in Matthew 20, verse 34. Matthew 20, verse 34. So Jesus had compassion on them and touched their eyes, and immediately their eyes received sight, and they followed him. You see the correlation here? We have compassion first. Now, he could have slapped them around a bit and opened their eyes, and they wouldn't have followed him. Right? <laughs> now we see who is slapping us. Let us run. But Jesus didn't do that. Jesus had compassion on them, touched their eyes, and immediately their eyes received sight, and they followed him. Mark 1, 41, And Jesus moved with compassion, put forth his hand, and touched him, and saith unto him, I will be thou clean. This is a leper who is wanting to be cleansed from his leprosy. And Jesus was moved with compassion and touched him. Now, why is compassion so important in soul winning? You know, preachers are up here and we are able to present a sermon by God's grace. We can't do it by ourselves. By God's grace, he, he enables us to do this. And from time to time, we can even give an invitation. But we can't always get to everybody that needs compassion. Do you realize that? We, everybody needs compassion, but the person that's up front can't always get to everybody. In fact, they don't always know who everybody is that actually needs the compassion. But here's an interesting thing. The people that are sitting out in the congregation oftentimes know each other and know a little bit more about what's going on, and they can actually reach out with compassion to one another. Here's where this thing comes into soul winning. When you come into an evangelistic series where we're preaching the message of the three angels' messages and there's strangers that are sitting in the audience... If you're afraid of them, it's going to be real hard to win them, right? If we are afraid of them, if we're like, you know, I see them. I know I've never seen them here before, but, you know, maybe somebody should go over and say hi to them, but not me, man. I'm just scared of that. <laughs> but compassion goes out of their way and says, hey, there's someone new. I want, they probably, they might feel a little uncomfortable around here. Maybe I can go over and at least break the ice and I'm not going to, I'm not going to, get all over them, but I say, hi, my name is, what's your name? We're so glad that you come to visit with us, right? So you can see where this compassion comes in because Jesus allowed compassion to override any fears of contracting leprosy because nobody in that day and age would ever touch a leper because you could, you could contract the stuff yourself and then you would be, you know, put out where uh, you'd have to be exiled from your surroundings and your loved ones, quarantined. But Jesus had compassion. He overrode any other fear, and he touched them. Mark 5.19 says, now this is, this, I, this is a story where he had healed these demoniacs. And the demoniac wanted to follow along with Jesus. But here's what Jesus said. Go home to your friends and tell them what great things the Lord has done for you and how he had compassion on you. Isn't this amazing? This is pretty amazing. 
Let's go down to Hebrews 5 too. There, there are so many more verses here. I've got two pages of verses, one after another here, because I just thought they're so interesting. But there's no way to go through them all and it would get tedious. But let's, let's make Hebrews 5 2 our last one here on this. Hebrews 5 2. Paul is uh, writing here, and once again, he's, he's talking about the, nat- you know, the character of, of Christ. And he says here, Who can have compassion on the ignorant and them that are out of the way? For he himself was also compassed with infirmity. Now, this is an interesting thing about Christ. We don't oftentimes think of him as one who is compassed with infirmity. Infirmity is frailty, weakness, disability, um, impairment. Now, we don't necessarily, he was, he was a perfect sacrifice, don't get me wrong in that way, but as a human being, he was frail enough to have to get thirsty and hungry, right? He was frail enough to where he would get tired. Uh, he was uh, weak enough where he would need sleep at night. Even if there was a great storm on the lake, he didn't have the, uh, the wakefulness to last through the night because he'd been working hard and he was exhausted. And so he had weakness. And, and as far as disabilities, it wasn't necessarily like he had a broken arm or anything, but he certainly was not um, at the same state he was before he was born. You know, before he was born, when he was on the throne of, in heaven, he was, could be everywhere at one time, right? He was, could be omnipresent and all those types of things. And so if you go going from being omnipresent to being singularly present, that is an impairment of ability, isn't it? <laughs> Uh, it's just like if we have an arm that can freely move or a leg that can freely move and it no longer can freely move, you know, it's, it's an impairment for us. He didn't have those kinds of impairments, but he confined himself to one place at one time. <laughs> and that, that's an impairment from his ability from before when he was on the throne of, he- of the heavens. And it says in the Bible that he came to bear our sicknesses and our diseases, even Lepers. Sin is pretty contagious. And the thing is, Jesus himself could have sinned and caught the disease if he had made the wrong choice on any number of those temptations that came his way. But his compassion overrode the fear of that type of thing happening You know, the whole universe could have imploded with sin. Jesus, in his compassion, took the risk in order for love to exist. And he came and he died on the cross for us. And he didn't get off when they asked him to, to show that he was the real God because of compassion. That's why it's called the passion, I believe, of the Christ. When we talk about his death on the cross, we often call it the passion. Jesus came to the fringes of celestial society to seek out the outcasts from his compassion, didn't he? came to the fringes to seek out the outcast of the celestial universe, of the universal society of perfect perfection. Our world alone was a mess. And he came here. No wonder Jesus says, go out into the highways and the byways and compel them to come in. But now we know, when we see that word compel, that we should translate that word with an adjective of compassion there, right? Because too many people read into that verse, go out into the highways and the byways and compel them to come in, and they build a rack, they build a stake, they built some sort of something to torture somebody on in order to get them into the kingdom of God. They, I wish, would have studied their Bibles a little bit further. The world would be a much different place if for a thousand years, instead of compulsion, compassion had been worked into the DNA of world society, right? 
but we have still within our reach the compassion of Christ. Let us take advantage of it. And just as we're closing, let's go to another story in the Bible. John 4 is the story of an outcast from society. Jesus met one day as he was journeying on and he was hot and he was tired and he was thirsty and he came to Jacob's well and he was sitting beside the well and it was about the sixth hour and a woman from Samaria came to draw water and Jesus said to her give me a drink and she's alone And Jesus asked for a drink. You know, you know the trust level factors for some people that are, have been hurt so bad in life or have, life has crumbled so far down that it's hard to say, get anybody, you know. Jesus could have said, trust me, you know, I have the water of life for you. And she would have been like, get out, <laughs> you know, let me run. But he says to her instead, could you give me a drink? And people sometimes that are so broken, so down, and so far in life that they, they can't imagine how to turn it around, there is in their heart an understanding that what it's like to hurt, to suffer need, and oftentimes they're really, really ready to help someone else out, even though they're in a, a dark spot themselves. So she would give him a drink. But she asked him, how is it that you, a Jew, ask for a drink from me, a woman from Samaria, for Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. Now, we could go back into that day and age, and we realize that Samaritans and Jews, they had this rivalry thing going on, and it caused all kinds of bigotry and all kinds of things going on where they wouldn't associate with one another. Do you know today there's still this kind of stuff that happens once in a while? Hopefully it's not because we've promoted it, but I'll tell you that there are people out there that won't associate with you because you're a Seventh-day Adventist. Okay, so this kind of thing still goes on. There's a separation. There's a bigotry that still happens in our world. How do we cross that line to win a soul for Jesus? Jesus is showing us how right here, and he is giving us methods and action. He reaches out with compassion to this lady. He gets into the conversation, and if you, if you want a really breakdown of this story, I'd suggest you go to the book Desire of Ages, and you'll get a really good breakdown of this story. We get down into the story where you can see how far broken this lady is uh, when Jesus says to her, go call your husband and come here in John 4, 16. And the woman answered, I have no husband. And Jesus said to her, you are right in saying I have no husband, for you have had five husbands, and the one you now have is not your husband. What you have said is true. Now can you imagine, in this particular society, it, this was a situation, I believe, would be where it was in the realm of the man to change how things were going on in the home. And so if things weren't going right in the home, well, the man's like, out, you know? They could divorce someone for a whim. They could issue a certificate of divorce for, you know, if they didn't like the way you had made toast in the morning, you know? Was, I don't know all what went on. There must have been some um, uh, accountability to her as well in the story. It kind of gives you that idea that she wasn't scot-free in, uh, in all these relationships. But you can imagine, even if you were making mistakes in your relationships, the trauma of being put out and told to leave and get out the door and go and find somewhere else is difficult. And when it happens once, it hurts. When it happens twice, it hurts twice as much. When it happens five times, you don't know how to relate to people anymore. And she doesn't even get into a marriage relationship after that. She's just hanging out with some guy who's willing to have her hang around. But there's no sort of commitment for anything. An arrangement of convenience that has no certainty attached to it whatsoever. Somehow, in the way Jesus said this, there is probably, and we can't always get this right, unless we ask Jesus to do it. Because there, 
somehow Jesus, in the way he said this, you've had five husbands, there was something in his tone of voice, I wish we could hear it, there was something in the look on his face, I wish we could see it, there was something that shined from his eyes that I wish we could also experience that let her know that there was hope. And she says, sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. Whatever he did there, and having that conversation with her about her sins, and this is where, you know, we have a long ways to learn how about soul winning from Jesus. I mean, I, I need to get on my knees more and ask him, Lord, whatever happened there, teach me how this works. Because she got excited to tell other people about how he talked to her about her sins. Come and see a man that told me everything that I ever did. Who does that? unless there's somebody with overwhelming compassion that she's pointing them to. Now, I know there's something here prophetic as well. She's drawing him because he's a prophet. And could this be the Christ? There's something here that's even beyond compassion. There's this almighty God factor coming in here. And that's what really needs to shine on people through the compassion, that this comes from the creator of the universe who can tell the beginning from the end and the end from the beginning. And all these things that are pertinent to an almighty God. They didn't hang around in town very long. They came in droves. The whole city came out to see Jesus. The woman was so excited, she just left her water jar. I don't know if Jesus actually got his drink or not, but uh, Come and see a man who told me whatever I did. Could this be the Christ? John 4, 29. They went out of the town and were coming to him. How many others had told her all that she had ever did and then forced her to leave? Isn't that something? He told her all she ever did and she wanted to stay. the effect of the Holy Spirit working in someone's heart and she was beginning to have this living water coming into her and already she was going and sharing Jesus with others. The effect of the Holy Spirit opening truth to any of us is like this. Thoughts from the Mount of Blessings, page 20, says that the Holy Spirit opens to you the truth. You will treasure up the most precious experiences and will long to speak to others of the comforting things that have been revealed to you. When brought into association with them, you will communicate some fresh thought in regard to the character of the work of Christ. You will have some fresh revelation of his pitying love to impart to those who love him and those who love him not. I find this very fascinating because I, I, I noticed three things there. It says that the effect of the Holy Spirit on us through Jesus is comforting and will treasure up the most precious experiences and long to speak to others of these comforting things. Number two, it leads to an urge to communicate. And didn't this happen with this lady at the well? She had this urge to communicate this comfort that had just been extended to her. I got to communicate it to others. When brought into association with them, you'll communicate some fresh thought in regard to the character of the work of Christ. And finally, thirdly, it'll be communicated in compassion. He will have some fresh revelation of his pitying love to impart to those who love him and to those who love him not. Father, forgive us for the times we have not had compassion. I'm speaking of myself. I've had plenty of those times. But when our eyes are opened and we see what God is like, we realize that it's more than just a word. It's more than just a teaching. It's more than just an offering appeal. It's more than just a... Uh, a decision on a card that people need to make a decision to follow God, to turn from sin to a savior. Isn't it? The character of compassion is in right in the middle of all of this. And so as we're heading into a soul winning season, I'd like for us to pray and ask the Lord to bestow upon us in a greater capacity than we've ever had before, compassion for people. Would you be willing to have that prayer for the next couple of months in the privacy of your room, in the privacy of your home? Ask the Lord for a heart of compassion that is not afraid of people. We still may not know what to do uh, in certain circumstances, but we know that we have a God that does, and we can ask him. Uh, soul winning is a science. Spirit of prophecy tells us 
And I tell you, I wish I had mastered the science. Uh, I think Jesus is the only one that has, and we're, we want to keep looking to him, don't we? Keep looking to Jesus. Well, if you have heard this sermon and, and you look back and you see times where compassion was not part of the process in your life, don't despair. Um, when you saw that there was hardness of heart, when there was harshness instead of softness, please remember 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And he can cleanse a hard heart and he can give us a heart of compassion. Uh-huh. Well, let us, um, you know, the angels were the first ones who kind of expressed this thing to the shepherds way back in, in Luke. And they said, peace on earth, goodwill towards men, expressing the character of God. And we're going to sing about the angels from the realms of glory in our closing hymn. Uh, we're going to do verses one and two, and I'll wait for our choristers to come up, and they'll lead the song, and then we'll close with prayer.